So, uh, being uh, obsessed with the future like you are, do you sometimes feel frustrated uh, at looking at the pace things are going around you? I do, I do. Um, What frustrates you most? Well, you know, I, I, I see things that are happening very often all over the world and William Gibson said it best when he said that the future is already here it's just not evenly distributed and I'm a big believer in that and I look you know I look across the water at the likes of uh, Tesla and the Model 3 availability in the US and it's not available in Europe yet uh, the you would buy one of those yes and no I, I would like the choice but I don't have a choice right now uh, I so you're frustrated by the lack of choice yeah because it's not available in Europe and and but still would you buy it you know, probably not. So why are you frustrated with it? Because there's, there's very little access to any electric vehicles here yet, and that's down to lack of battery, battery production facilities, which is something that will ramp up and we will get over that, that issue right now. Uh, I have ordered an electric car, it's a Nissan Leaf, and the reason I've ordered a Nissan Leaf is because my current car is a Toyota Prius. It's a 10-year-old car and it has 103,000 kilometers on the clock. So I do about 10,000 kilometers a year. So that's not a lot. So just doing 10,000 kilometers a year, I could not justify buying a car as expensive as a Model 3 if it were available here, a Tesla Model 3 or an S or an X or any of the Tesla cars because they're very expensive. Whereas the Nissan Leaf comes in around 30,000 euros and there are subventions available which brings it down even more to about 25 or so. And then there's a trade-in on the Prius which brings it down even more. So, you know, it's an affordable car. For 10,000 kilometers a year, you know, that's, that's easily, easy, easily justifiable. Is, but is it? If you break, this, break that down, it's going to come down in the next 10 years at roughly 200 euros per month. You could ride an Uber almost any time you want for those 10,000 kilometers you're doing every year and then use the airplane or train for anything else. So is the car something you really need or you, you, you need the option, the availability of that just to, for peace of mind? Yeah, well, I like it for peace of mind. I also have kids and they have to get to school. And calling an Uber to bring the kids to school in the morning, not really a good one. And for football practice in the afternoon, doesn't really work out either. And Uber's not available in Spain where I live, which is another issue. <laughs> so going further on the point, I get your point, I get your point. Um, but yeah, I, I still, I think in time, uh, fewer and fewer people will own cars and they will be using autonomous vehicles as they come into market. Uh, I think what are today uh, two car families will switch to one car family and then use autonomy for what's missing. People who are one might go to zero. But when will that happen? Because I've been talking to companies in the autonomous in the car industry and they've been telling us the telling technology is already here. We have any, everything you need to make the car autonomous from point A to point B and back and use it for car sharing or ride sharing or whatever in between. So that car should be working for more than 10% of its lifespan. Mm. But it's still not here because of people, governments, cities? No, I think autonomous cars are not here still for technical reasons. Um, uh, not fully autonomous anyway. There are no level five autonomous cars on the market, none. But the technology is there, so they tell me. The technology is close, it's not there yet. LiDARs, for example, can't see through rain or snow so they can't operate in those conditions. Um, similarly, uh, a big issue for autonomous cars is going to be access to almost real-time high-definition mapping and because roads change, you know, uh, so that's, that's an issue. And to be a little bit controversial, I think actually flying taxis are going to get here before fully autonomous cars. Now, it'll, it'll depend from, from place to place, okay. Some places will have access to high definition, almost real time mapping because they'll be very densely populated with cameras and things like that. So yeah, then we might get autonomous vehicles there first, but the flying taxis, the technology for those is here today, whereas level five is not for cars. And flying taxis don't need high definition real time mapping because they're just going vertically. What they need is collision avoidance systems and vehicle to vehicle communications. And that's being developed at the moment in a partnership between Uber Air and NASA. And that's going to be fully electric? Fully electric, fully autonomous. Also for the flying cars? Yep. Yes. So that's sci-fi already? Yes, it is. What we don't have yet, Uber Air is rolling out tests of their autonomous uh, flying taxis 
in Los Angeles, Dubai, Dallas, and Sydney in between 2020 and 2023. Uh, there's lots of other companies in there as well. There's the likes of Volocopter, Volocopter heavily invested in by Intel. There's the likes of Lilium, who are very heavily invested in by Atomico. Uh, Ehang, the Chinese. Ehang, the Chinese one. Uh, then there's the, uh, the incumbents, Boeing and uh, Airbus, Airbus, are also very heavily. Uh, Airbus had their first successful flights with their Vahana uh, flying taxi will, earlier will, this will year. Will they not be expensive as hell? No, quite the opposite. They'll be cheap because they won't... Cheaper than cars? Yep. Well, as cheap. As cheap. What are the costs? What are the costs of running them? Because, they, because they're autonomous, because they can work almost 24-7. I say almost because they'll have to have downtime to charging. Maybe they'll swap batteries. That might work. A battery swap is only a couple of seconds. So they'll be, they'll be pretty much 24-7. They won't have a driver to pay. In a taxi today, the driver is 50% of the cost. Because they're electric drivetrains... 95% of the problem. <laughs> you said that. <laughs> no, it, it, it's statistics. 95% of all car accidents are human error. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Would you, would, you, uh, be, would you feel safe in a flying taxi? You know, An autonomous flying taxi? I think probably after the first flight. Okay. You know, I, I, think, I think, and I think it'll be that way for a lot of people, uh, that they'll get into the first one and they'll be nervous, but after the first one or two or three, then that'll go away. I would love to have um, an autonomous car and just sleep over on the way to work. I have no pleasure of driving in the Bucharest traffic. It's just as bad as anywhere else. Yeah. So I would rather sleep. But what keeps you motivated? What gives you uh, a strong hope for the future? I've been seeing some statistics in your presentation and I totally agree with that. Everything is getting better. Yeah. But what's the best you can see out of everything we get? I didn't talk about it today because it wasn't relevant to the conversation except for that little bit at the start in the change in healthcare. I think the use of AI and sensors in healthcare is going to completely change how we deal with, with people who are ill or unwell. Uh, Fabio talked a little bit in his presentation about predictive maintenance and the, the use of sensors and connectivity and AI and cloud in healthcare means we will be moving to a world of predictive maintenance for people. In other words, we will be wearing sensors, they will be giving off data all the time about our vital statistics. Those data will go into a personal private health cloud and when they go, go above or below particular thresholds, then an alert will be sent to our trusted healthcare provider. Yes, but isn't that also about classic medicine, about prolonging our old age instead of prolonging our youth? Uh, the, the two things are true. The, I mean, when, when I'm talking about the, the use of predictive maintenance for people, it's not just for young people, it's for old people, it's for everyone. And if you contrast what happens today, today if you're feeling unwell, you call your doctor's surgery or your local healthcare clinic, you schedule an appointment in the next day or two, you go, you wait in the clinic, waiting in the waiting room with five or six other people who are unwell, uh, who are coughing and spluttering. Uh, when you do finally get to get, when you do finally get to see your healthcare provider, uh, you're now thinking about your next meeting across town, maybe it's to pick up your kids, maybe it's to meet your manager, maybe it's to see a customer or whatever. So you're stressed and then the doctor takes your pulse and your blood pressure and they're very high and, and they try and make a diagnosis based on that. Whereas if they have several weeks or months of data and they see a blip at a certain point in time and they can have it in context and then they can pull you in before you walk in the door they're already thinking of what the diagnosis is likely to be based on all the data they actually have. So it's a very different healthcare experience. Last question. What do you feel about this digital divide? It's bad, it's really bad. Uh, having this, it's more than a generation gap now. It's, a, it's two different worlds, people living in two different worlds. But still, Romania has gone broadband much faster than any other country in Europe because we went from nothing to Ethernet. So we went past ADSL and modems and stuff like that. And now Africa is rising so fast, they're building motorways everywhere and using renewables, like China is going to electric cars. Do you think going from the bottom is helping you go much faster into the future nowadays? I think it can do. I think it can do. Because you can leapfrog, as you rightly said, about going from zero to, to fiber uh, here in Romania or in Africa going to renewables. You don't have the sunk costs of the network already in place. You can go, as you say, from zero to fiber. 
companies like uh, Enel, for example, we're here today with Enel, they have large generation facilities for coal, for nuclear, you know, and they have probably, I don't know what Enel's finances are like, but I, I suspect they have loans against those things that they're paying back over years, uh, which, it would, which would be perfectly normal. So you can't just write those off and close them and shutter them. But let's leapfrog. Hmm. What would you leapfrog right now? Uh, straight into uh, fully electric autonomous cars, straight into uh, uh, healthcare as I described it, uh, straight into food production, which is uh, done in large uh, for plants plant food done in large indoor vertical farms uh, and for meat which is done either in bioreactors or from plant protein uh, and that way if we can take back from agriculture all the land that it is appropriated from biodiversity we've seen a 70% drop in biodiversity in the last 30 years. Uh, we need to take that back, we need to return the land to biodiversity, and not just biodiversity, but reforestation, so that we can then plant more trees to suck more CO2 out of the air and possibly mitigate the effects of, carbon, of, of climate change. Climate change, that's another big, big topic, and I'm not going to go into that because uh, we had enough of your time. Tom Raftery, thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, joining us in Bucharest for NL Focus On, and uh, I hope we'll see you soon again. Where can we follow you? You can follow me on Twitter at, at Tom Raftery. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram, you can follow me on any of the normal social channels, LinkedIn, whatever it is, just type in Tom Raftery. There are not many people with my name. So it's, it's and your hat. Your name. Hat. It's, it's my brand. What about a hat? Well, I live in the south of Spain and I am Irish with a very pale complexion, so I need protection from the sun. It was either a hat or I walk around with a parasol all the time. So, An Irish in Spain talking about future in Bucharest and now you have it. Thank you again, Tom. You, have a safe flight home.